Good evening, everyone. I'm Hilary Short, a member of Sunnybrook's Board of Directors, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's lecture series. We are very glad to be back, albeit in a different format, for the many of you who are used to joining us in person. As you know, COVID-19 has changed every aspect of our lives, including how we will be able to share our speaker series content. While it is not yet safe to host the speaker series talks in person, we recognize the importance of staying connected with you, our community. We understand that these online talks will be an adjustment for many of you and truly appreciate your ongoing support and understanding. For the foreseeable future, we'll continue to bring you up to date health information virtually, all while keeping you and our staff as safe as possible. So given the realities we are facing, what better topic to start with than COVID-19? We have gathered a wonderful panel of experts this evening who have been working on the forefront of care throughout this pandemic. You'll soon hear from them about how to minimize your risk of getting sick, as well as what rehabilitation strategies are helping patients recover. Importantly, there is also a presentation on managing stress and practicing mindfulness to help get through this unprecedented time in our lives. If you haven't already, please consider signing up to the speaker series mailing list. You can do so online through the page you are watching tonight's lecture on. I'd now like to introduce you to the expert who will be moderating tonight's discussions, Dr. Dan Cass. Dr. Cass is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Executive here at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Dr. Cass oversees the hospital's physician team and supervises operations of our five busy clinical programs. We are most fortunate to have Dr. Cass with us this evening. And without further ado, I'll pass the evening over to him. Thank you, Dr. Cass. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Good evening to everyone joining us remotely. As Hillary said, this is a, a new format for us, uh, but uh, I think many of us on the uh, online tonight are, are more familiar with Zoom than we ever were a few months ago. So hopefully uh, people will feel more and more comfortable with this format as we go on. Tonight, our program is called COVID-19 from prevention to recovery. And we're very fortunate, as Hillary mentioned, to have a great lineup of speakers for you. Natasha Salt will start the talks off with a discussion around protecting your health and tips to help prevent COVID-19 infection. Dr. Larry Robinson will provide us with a great presentation on rehabilitation strategies. And then Dr. Robert Simpson will lead us through a discussion on managing stress and trying to find peace in the moment, something that uh, for many of us, we've probably focused less on than we ought to, given the, the incredible disruption to our lives that has uh, resulted in the last few months. Uh, we will definitely set aside some time at the end of the evening for you to ask our panel of speakers some questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who has already submitted a question online, but please feel free to also send questions while the presentations are happening through the webpage. We may not be able to get to every question, but we will do our very best in the time that we have available tonight. So to begin the lectures, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Natasha Salt is the Director of Infection Prevention and Control here at Sunnybrook. We're very glad to have her here this evening to talk about prevention, best steps, and latest knowledge. Over to you, Natasha. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Cass and Hillary um, for the introductions. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this sort of inaugural Zoom um, speaker series and I'm just going to try and share my screen right now and work through a presentation that we put together um, on some of these uh, your questions as well as just general um, COVID prevention strategies. So 
So first, I want to begin with just giving you a general idea of um, what the contents of my presentation will be. So I will touch on um, modes of transmission. I know there's been a lot in uh, a lot to digest around transmission of COVID, a lot of conflicting information. Is it airborne? Is it not airborne? Um, I, I want to explain some of those things because a lot of these term this terminology has been sort of used loosely um, in the media and, uh, and amongst our, our friends and our colleagues. And I want to try and help you understand these different types of modes um, and how COVID currently um, we know is transmitted. I also want to touch a little bit upon um, the rates in Ontario. I think it's important to reflect on what is happening currently in Toronto, where we sort of were, where we you know we're in the summertime and kind of where we might be predicting where we are going so i think that's a definitely of interest here um i will go through uh different risks of transmission and, and i've got a, a a few good pictorials i think will be helpful in um sort of understanding what is our risk when we're you know walking to the grocery store or out out with friends or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, how can we prevent transmission when we are putting ourselves in environments where we may not necessarily be amongst people that are in our social bubble. And then um, lastly, just a bit on um, the testing uh, for COVID and uh, our assessment centers that are available. So first of all, um, transmission. So we've heard a lot. Um, is it droplet contact spread? Is it airborne spread? So I want to really confirm here that droplet and contact transmission is still the most predominant way that we know that this virus is transmitted. And that is similar to like, you know, somebody with the flu or somebody with a cold. Um, we know that when they cough and sneeze, if we're in close proximity to them, that we may be at risk of um, catching what they have. And COVID is no different. It's still kind of in that realm of that is transmitted via these droplets. So droplets being we cough and sneeze and someone inhales uh, those particles and becomes infected. Contact transmission on the other hand is when we cough or sneeze and those uh, sneezes and coughs land on surfaces in and around us. So it could be our keyboards, it could be door handles, it could be anywhere. And so, you know, those surfaces also pose a risk because someone could come along, touch those surfaces, and then um, not clean their hands and inadvertently touch their face, their nose, mouth, eyes, uh, therefore introducing COVID. So those are the two main ways that we know that COVID is transmitted. Where there has been a lot of debate and what a lot of people, even in this weekend, I was reading through some articles around um, whether or not there's some potential for airborne spread. So airborne spread in the infection control world is very different than droplet and contact spread. Airborne spread means things like measles or things like chicken pox. And if you can reflect upon an experience in your life where maybe um, you know you, you were in contact with someone with chicken pox or with measles, these are things where um, they're very easily transmitted. Chicken pox is a very good example because these are what that was one of the more um, childhood diseases that were very much spread in our communities before vaccine was around. And so it doesn't take much for one person to show up and then everybody who hasn't been exposed becomes um, sick. And so this virus, COVID virus, is still different. It's not acting like, you know, chicken pox per se. Um, and so where the debate happens is, is two meters enough or is it further that it might spread a bit more? And I think that depends on a variety of different things. And um, some of the points that I put here is, is that, you know, there's a, one of the main chief things I think that's most important is the ventilation. So ventilation, um, you know, we need ventilation in general and not having any ventilation, this, you know, the air is not being cleared um, and there's more potential for something to stagnate in the environment. And so this is where the, the question of uh, airborne transmission comes up is you have a bunch of people say on a plane for example and there's not good air circulation and more people um, get sick than not and so you know um, I think we're still learning a lot I'm not going to say that um, you know that it's that uh, airborne transmission can completely be excluded. But I do wanna say that all the information that we see, even in our own hospital, would lend us to know that it's droplet and contact uh, transmission is the most predominant way that this organism can be spread. Um, 
you know, uh, again, transmission will be dependent on a lot of other things. I've written, written here the infectivity of the host. So meaning that how, how sick is that person really that you're coming in contact with? Are they at the peak of their illness where there's a lot of shedding? Um, are they coughing a lot? Are they, you know, is there a lot of symptoms that would project this into the environment? Um, you know, how long are you exposed to uh, an individual? And so, you know, being in a room for an extended period of time is very different than passing someone um, on your afternoon walk outdoors in uh, along a, a pathway. Um, you also want to consider the susceptibility of the exposed person. So for some people, something it, it doesn't, they may not get infected, but other people are very susceptible, maybe have underlying illnesses or are sick. And these individuals might, um, you know, uh, it might take a lower dose for them to get sick. Um, you also want to think about the type of activity you're doing, if you're indoors or outdoors, and of course, most importantly, the ventilation. So here's some information I took off uh, from the Toronto Public Health website on just Toronto rates per 100,000 uh, people. And you can definitely see that the darker areas, um, and again, this, these stats were uh, up to September the 17th, so just in and around uh, over the weekend, most updated, where you can see there's definitely certain areas and pockets, which um, there's a lot more COVID activity uh, occurring. Uh, that could be for a variety of different reasons, um, one of which there's many times there's multiple uh, families living in, in households um, and living in closer quarters. Um, and, and of course, you know, again, the downtown uh, core may not necessarily have a lot of residents living there, whereas the more people live outside of the re um, downtown core and you can start to see where um, rates start to kind of escalate in uh, different areas. Here is a slide from uh, Public Health Ontario confirmed cases. I just wanted to give everyone kind of a look at um, where we were at. So going back our, um, into March and where are we had our first wave and then um, where we are now. So you can definitely see that there's some activity um, creeping up now. Um, is it our second wave? We don't know that. Is it a slow sort of um, a smoldering um, uh, activity that's happening right now uh, could be, um, but we're definitely uh, keeping an eye on things and 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 working with the notion of that where there is community spread right now and and there there could be increased um, strain on our, on our resources in the hospital. Um, what what you can't what I really wanted to show to you here is all this blue area. These are all people that have reported either close contact with someone that's been sick or was in an outbreak. So again, going back to that piece where I talked to you about the droplet and contact spread, this gives us a good indication that you really need to be close to someone in order for something to spread. And this again, you know, if we if this was airborne, we would have a lot more cases where we didn't know how or how they possibly could have been infected. So, um, you know, we do have people that have had no uh, epi link. These are the small, uh, smaller yellow bars. Um, some people that had no information, and then at the early end of the of the, um, the in the beginning of the first wave, you can see a lot of people were related to travel. So, travel again being a predominant in the beginning, but not so much now as um, travel restrictions. Um, have been in place and there's been a lot less travel activity but that's still again we do see imported cases that are associated with travel this slide i wanted to put in place because i know that there's a lot of discussion around well who's who's transmitting um, what are the rates in ontario and and here you can see you know a lot of concern with people going back to school and will the kids be the ones that are, are transmitting you can see that kids have been played a very minor role um, in transmission um, in this pandemic um, and in fact uh, to be um, honest and real to the time right now our biggest concern is actually people who are in the category of 20 to 40 that's the age range that we're seeing that is generating that that last sort of like creep up 
So we're seeing people who are sort of relaxing back into their pre-COVID sort of state, I want to call it. And when we look at what their risk factors were and why they might have acquired COVID, it becomes apparent that people are getting back together, people are getting more comfortable in their surroundings, people are engaging in activities like they may have pre-COVID. Um, and it's sort of reflected in that age category where they may be a little bit more um, apt to take some risks. And so again, you know, I just want to point out here, the children, we're going to keep an eye on them, but I think the, some of the real people that we also need to get some messages out to um, are above the 20 year old mark and in, in trying to make sure that they're, um, you know, abiding sort of by the, the, the public health recommendations that are in place to try and prevent the transmission of COVID. I like this slide, I decided to add it because um, as everyone um, is aware, Ontario has been very um, uh, proactive in testing and has actually made testing widely available to everybody who wants to get a test. Um, and so what you can see in the beginning of our pandemic, we had a lot less testing, but a lot of those people who are getting tested actually were COVID positive, as you can see from the way that the chart here is um, reflecting. Um, but then once we started to open up testing and a lot more people were getting tested that were asymptomatic um, um, and that might have been the worried well or people that, you know, were going to see their, their elderly um, parents who wanted to maybe make sure they didn't have COVID. All these people are getting tested and you can see our percent positivity. So the number of people actually testing positive has been quite low and sustained that way for quite some time. Um, now, though, you can see just similar to our, our COVID rates going up in the earlier slide, you can see our positivity rate is slowly starting to creep up here. And this is where we're starting to get a little bit more nervous about what's happening in the community. So I like this slide because um, it really sends a lot of mixed messages. What, what am I looking at? What kind of uh, precautions should I use? You know, I hear this from one person or I hear this from another agency or, you know, I'm really just confused. What are the things that I should be doing? Um, and, you know, how can I protect myself from getting COVID? And I hope to make a little bit more sense of things in the upcoming slides for you by sort of equating them to a stoplight. And I'll start with the red light and what we really should not be doing or avoiding altogether. And, you know, traveling is, you know, it's a big one. I think it still remains high on our priority to not travel. I do know that there's certainly um, agencies and, and different, um, and people are taking advantage of, you know, sales and everything else to try and travel. And the thing is, is it's, it's still not a good risk to take. Um, you can by yourself be able to go online and see um, the, the, the COVID rates that in different locations that are much, much, much higher and more excessive um, in, in uh, different destinations. And I would definitely discourage traveling um, as much as possible if, if you even have to at all. Uh, large indoor gatherings, lo lo even large outdoor gatherings, if you don't need to attend them, uh, you know, it's still better to defer all of these activities. And in fact, you know, even our provincial government has um, just uh, over the past few days res further restricted, um, you know, the, the indoor gatherings uh, to try to, you know, help um, eliminate some of the risk factors with uh, people congregating and uh, transmitting. So, you know, and then you, you would think, oh, uh -huh, yeah, buffets are sharing food. I, I want to tell you, you know, even, even in places um, like a hospital where you think we, we have all these great measures in place and we do, we certainly have, this is such a safe place. I said that from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this is a place where I feel most comfortable because I know we have measures in place to make sure that we're protecting people that come in, protecting our staff, but where we sometimes actually let our guard down is when we're amongst our own colleagues and friends. And this, uh, you could see this happening even throughout our own organization and other partnering hospitals where co-workers become more comfortable and they, they get together in eating areas and may sort of like uh, you know, 
decide that it's okay. I work with you all day. I'm going to take my mask off. I'm going to eat. But here, you know, this is where I worry where colleagues actually become your big, biggest risk factor because we don't know what everyone's doing or what kind of exposures they've had uh, in the community. And so I'm encouraging anyone that still has to go into an office um, you know, or public kind of space where you might be um, having to share rooms where you're eating to take critically take a look at that space and make sure that it's safe and that you're still maintaining all the different um, recommendations in trying to prevent transmission in those spaces. Um, or can you eat alone or can you eat outside? I mean, that's becoming more of a challenge with the weather, but these are things that you should be thinking. Here's my yellow light. So, you know, the proceed with caution. Um, yeah, definitely we need to re get back into the swing of going into sort of a routine, being able to access things like uh, grocery stores, malls, um, whenever we need to. But if, if you, if, if it's not something that's really important, if you can order something online, or if you can avoid any kind of congregation and areas, that would be my advice um, as best as you can. But otherwise, you know, um, some of these places, as we'll go through some of the things to protect yourself from um, transmission, these places have some of that already in, in place as soon as they started opening. Um, and, and even grocery stores have always maintained physical distances, making sure you're wearing your mask, um, and even, in fact, providing hand sanitizer uh, prior to um, your shopping experience. So, you know, the other things that you want to proceed with caution, again, all these different things are like sports activities are starting to come back into play. Hockey is coming back into play, skating, all the different activities. And I think you still have to, you know, um, all these all these um, different organizations are definitely trying to partner to make sure that there are providing the most safest environment. Uh, but those are questions that you have to ask yourself. If you have children or if you you yourself are involved in um, sports or volleyball or any kinds of activities, what is it that they're doing to make sure that that environment is safe for you? And, you know, cleaning your hands would obviously be one thing, but also making sure that you have things that are cleaned and disinfected would be another and so on and so forth. I'll get into some more of those details in a bit. Um, you know, we're, go we're attending school. So yes, we're attending school, but great. You know what else? The schools also have some great measures in place. Um, and I can see even, um, you know, they have uh, the screening and surveillance and no tolerance for any kind of symptoms. They're cleaning hands. So this is great. We have to make sure that we're, we continue to empower our schools to make sure that they're enforcing those um, uh, requirements. And then in some case, augmenting with Zoom, which is fantastic as well. Um, socially, having smaller socially distance uh, gather, outdoor gatherings still is something that we can consider. Um, again, thinking about who we're connecting with and making sure that no one's sick would be also be important in that situation. And then indoor activities. So going to restaurants, working at the office, sports, all these things is we have to think about kind of the, I call them the layering effect for trying to prevent transmission. And I'll get into all of that. So when you do participate in these things in this kind of caution area, you have those things um, sort of at hand and you should be protected. And then here we come to the green light. So these are things that you would do where it's kind of, you know, you're not going to get exposed. If you're at home with your social bubble, you're probably not going to have an exposure. If you're working from home. Um, if you're outside with your social bubble, participating in video conferencing, uh, any kind of independent outdoor exercises. And I think um, a lot of people have really sort of uh, augmented their lifestyles in order to be able to to um, do some of the things that they like doing um, in different ways. And this would be a good example of things that are pretty safe to do outside um, independently as well. So I came across this slide and I liked it. And I liked it because, you know, there's a lot of people that ask me about face coverings um, and the how face coverings protect or not protect. And this slide is great because what it does is it talks to you and, and gives you four different scenarios about wearing face coverings or not wearing face coverings. So wearing face coverings is at the top to not wearing any face coverings and being exposed for a while to people. And they talk about the different categories of what we do most. So we might be silent and sitting on 
uh, you know, the GTC, we might be speaking, um, like we might be in a, in a, a social gathering or shouting or singing. Um, and you can see that, you know, once we come down to no face coverings and contact for a prolonged period of time, you see a lot of red zone here, where the probability is pretty high that you could, you could, there is transmissibility will happen and that you might pick up COVID if someone in the room has COVID. Um, but when you're wearing face coverings and you're only around people for a short period of time, you can see most of that is actually in the green, except for when we're talking about doing something like shouting and singing in a poorly ventilated area. So I think this chart is nice because it really, it does say essentially speaks to me that if you go about, um, you know, protecting yourself, wearing face coverings, um, minimizing your contact with people outside of sort of your social bubble, that you should be relatively in the green and, and protected. This um, poster I came across, and this poster um, I had to do a little bit of clipping out of because I didn't support necessarily the, the, the levels of risk associated with each, but I really like the, the pictorial that it describes. So you can see at the top, you have two people who are not wearing masks very easy for virus to be transmitted in that way. In the second picture, you have someone who's, you know, probably sneezing or coughing or talking and they're in close contact, but the person's only wearing a mask. So the potential there still exists because not you're in close contact and your eyes are exposed. And this is not typically not a medical mask if you're if we're wearing it out in public. So again, that mask may provide you with somewhat of a barrier, but your eyes are still exposed and you're in close contact. The next slide, the next picture, I should say, um, you know, again, definitely decreasing the probability. But if you look at the one person who's coughing or, or sneezing here into his mask, there's still secretions that are going to come out of that mask. And so this person who's in close contact is not in the free, free, free and clear, so to speak is still in close contact and may be able to uh, inhale those particles. And then again, the next picture below that, further enhancing their, um, you know, both of them wearing a mask. Again, this is even likely decreasing our risk even more. Each time we're successively decreasing our risk of actually picking up uh, COVID or any other respiratory pathogen for that matter. And then the last one is where they show you, you, you're honoring that six feet difference. You're both wearing masks. That's when you're likely to really considerably, um, if not fully decrease your risk of any transmission. So I wanted to talk a bit about masks. So not all masks are created equally, not all face coverings are created equally. And I thought it was worth a mention here. Um, here, this is a, a great slide. Um, next couple slide decks are from uh, posters that I, I sniffed from the CDC. And I like them because they're very to the point and say exactly what um, I'd want to convey. So here they show you a mask. So here's a nice uh, mask that shows two layers. So having um, two or more layers of a washable, breathable fabric um, is important. You want to make sure that these masks are always fully covering your nose and your mouth and usually come under your chin uh, to help you protect um, it from sliding up and down. The other thing I really like um, is that, you know, in the last picture, it says fit snugly against the sides of your face and doesn't have any gaps. And, and you know, one of the things that can help with that also is some masks are created with a bit of a, uh, a wire that comes in and around the nose. And those masks, you can sort of fit more snugly to your your face and it also helps it from um, slipping down which you know is, I've seen is a problem with some masks so, so those are some of the features of a mask that you might want to look for um, when you're um, looking for fabric masks or um, masks that can be worn in the community and then I've also seen in this picture it doesn't show but masks are also created with tie-ups and so masks with tie-ups um, are also a, a beneficial because it helps to create a bit of a, a snugger fit if you because you can adjust it to some to some degree you can tighten it if it's not tight enough and so um, I, I've definitely seen those and and uh, and I think you know they're a good fit for people that are really trying to improve the the fit. What you want to avoid is any kind of masks that are make it hard to breathe. Um, you know, when I saw this, I was a little bit surprised to see vinyl mask in general, but 
I Googled it and they exist. So, um, you know, I, it's I stay away from anything that makes it hard to breathe because if you're putting something on your face that makes it difficult to breathe, you're going to be apt to play with it. You're going to want to move it around um, and you'll feel very uncomfortable and it may increases, increase your chances of, you know, coming in contact with your face with dirty hands or introducing the uh, virus in that way. Um, masks with exhalation valves. So these little circles that you see on some people's masks, these are actually not a good thing at all because it defeats the whole purpose of what the mask was intended to do. So these um, little circles, what they do is allow for the air to expel out of that, to allow for ease of breathing and exhalation. But when you're doing that, it, you might as well not even be wearing the mask because when you do that, all of your particles are still coming out of that mask. So we actually don't allow people to come into our hospital if they're wearing their homemade mask and it has these exhalation valves because we know that it's not offering any protection to those around them. And then of course, um, you know, an avoidance for using any kinds of masks that are not it, that are intended for healthcare. Um, as you will all appreciate, uh, there's a lot of competition globally for all kinds of different products and trying to get healthcare, healthcare grade um, masks where they're needed is very important. So making sure that there are N95 masks available for hospital staff that are working directly with COVID positive patients, doing high risk procedures that puts them at high risk of contracting COVID remains highly important. So, um, you know, I, I think we definitely, it's worth mentioning here that the fabric masks um, are what we would want to use in the community while retaining um, the medical masks for the medical community. And then they also speak to some other masks and coverings that don't necessarily um, have evaluations that have been completed on their effectiveness. So here we have um, these uh, gaiters, which are wrap around like sort of like a bandana. Um, and we don't know the effectiveness, I think partially because as well, there's um, the layering effect that we're uncertain about. And then here we have someone with just a face shield you know, we, we, this still doesn't allow for full coverage. It does give a little bit of mechanical coverage to stop someone from coughing and sneezing. But meanwhile, it can definitely go in and around the mask and underneath, which is the concern. Um, of course, um, there's some information here as well for kids um, and the same kinds of ideas, making sure that you find something that uh, works for them, that they, you know, uh, enjoy wearing. I think it's important. Um, if you uh, engage them, I think, in the process of getting their own mask, I think it gives them a bit of ownership and it gives them um, the desire to wear it and wear it properly. Um, and then um, if you wear glasses, of course, the important thing here is, is finding something that fits closely. Um, and they show this individual here with a, a, the wire uh, around the nose. So again, this becomes even more important with someone who's wearing glasses. Wearing, um, getting one that has a wire will help prevent fogging. This individual, I think, may even have uh, a tie-up. As you can see, it goes over the crown of her head. So again, tying it up will help to kind of help that snug fit. Okay, so now um, I get into what I call the layering effect. And, and I like this little picture of this baby because um, you've got to, a, a parent that's very cautious and worried about uh, protecting their baby from the elements. And, and this is the, sort of the way that I think of um, us in the community and, and how do, can we protect ourselves from COVID. So I call this layering up for COVID-19. So what I'm trying to say by saying layering up for COVID-19 is the more of these that you can collectively put together, the better your chances are for decreasing your risk of transmission of COVID. So I often get asked, well, you know, that I, I, I'm wearing my mask all the time. Is it really that important that I maintain that two meter separation? And my answer to that is as much as possible, you should continue to maintain that two meters of separation. Um, I said that also part earlier in my slides around um, where you can see there's a measurable decrease 
um, in the potential for transmission when you start to add these things together. So here, physical distancing is an important one. Not touching your eyes, nose and mouth, again, for the contact transmission. Um, having proper ventilation in areas where you are. So um, a lot of places have done some enhancement to ventilation, maybe likely because they had very little to begin with. Um, and in some cases, it's not necessarily to do anything to your ventilation because it's operating as intended, you're getting air circulation. I would say that this is um, the case for most norm, you know, homes that have an HVAC system in place um, or organizations that have an HVAC system in place. Um, travel, again, if you can avoid travel, I have a plane here, but it's not just about planes. It's just about travel in general. Um, the, the less you uh, put yourself in a position where you're traveling to an area where COVID-19 is more endemic, the, the more likely you are not to get in contact with it. So I think it's very important to try and stay a home base. Yes, I know home base might seem like the COVID cases are going up, but here we definitely have a little bit of a, a handle on what's happening, where the activity is, and we're trying to definitely put measures in place to prevent uh, further transmission. Here I have a, an a icon for the um, Canada COVID tracker app. And I, I, you know, I'm promoting that as well because I think um, it, it will help us to identify, to self-identify when there might've been an exposure. And um, that's one step ahead, again, in making us think about, well, where was I? What was I doing? And you know, should I get tested? Again, these are, these are all very good, important strategies in, in trying to um, you know, prevent further spread in the community and also protect ourselves. Here I have a picture of um, staying home when you're sick. Um, so, you know, that's always, always, always something that we've all promoted from infection prevention and control. Um, for the course of my whole career in infection control, I think we've been pushing that. And, and it's never been more apparent now than ever that we need to make sure that we're staying home when we're sick. And the great thing is, is I think that people are really getting this message and they're staying home, but we definitely do situ see situations where people let their guard down, think they have some minor symptoms and go ahead and you know participate in social activities. And this is what we're trying to stay away from. We wanna make sure that everyone stays home when they're sick. Additionally, um, this is uh, you know a good staying home in general. I, I had this, the Home Canada slide um, as my introductory slide. And I think I, I love that um, when it first came out and it was uh, popular in the beginning of the pandemic because it really made us think about why do we need to go out? Do we really need to go out? What can we do from home? And a lot of people have changed the way they behave and those that can stay at home are staying at home. And for people like me that have to go to work, I'm very thankful about the fact that there's less people um, outside that I might be interacting with. And by decreasing all these interactions, we're again making it very hard for the virus to get around. Um, so here, staying away from sick people, of course. I know this becomes very uh, challenging when uh, people have household contacts, but trying to minimize that exposure. And, and I won't get into Toronto Public Health recommendations or any kind of recommendations when you have a COVID positive person in your home because Toronto Public Health is very good at um, relaying that information if and when it happens. But just minimizing contact with sick individuals is very important in preventing transmission of COVID. Then next I have a picture of um, disinfection. This is another common question that comes up quite frequently for me in that um, people want to know how, how important is disinfection and how important is the environment. I think what I'll say to you is it's most important to stay away from people that are sick, people that are coughing and, and close contact with respiratory secretions. But, you know, the environment can't be excluded as playing a role in um, transmission as well. Because as I said, anyone can cough, anyone can sneeze, and germs can be put onto any surface. And we do know that um, coronavirus, COVID virus, along with many other viruses, can survive for sustained periods of time outside of the body and on inanimate surfaces. And so it is important um, in the context of, you know, shared environments like workstations that are shared or uh, common doorknobs that are touched by multiple people or, 
environments, uh, common spaces in condos, for example, um, that, we're, that we have a, a rigorous cleaning and disinfection uh, program still in place. How significant is this in your own household if you're abiding by all the COVID, other COVID uh, measures, you're staying home, you're physically distancing, you're doing all that other stuff, probably less important because it's unlikely that COVID is being introduced into your home. But it's more the public spaces and everywhere else where the contact of the environment becomes ever much more important. If you were to have someone that had COVID in your household, then that's a different story. And uh, public health also has some very good recommendations about how to clean, easily clean and disinfect an environment with simple household products like bleach and water and that are very effective as well. Um, avoiding crowds, super important. Uh, and uh, just looking at my time, I'll just make sure they don't go over. Um, hand hygiene, of course, can't be overemphasized. We've talked about it since the beginning of the pandemic and that hasn't changed. One of the best methods of preventing transmission is by keeping your hands clean. And keeping your hands clean means um, sanitizing bare hands, either sanitizing or washing them with soap and water. There's so many times that I see people that are wearing gloves in public, for example, or that come to the hospital thinking that gloves are important as a, a barrier or protection. And to be quite honest, gloves can be very um, can be very deceptive because the wearer may be wearing them for extended periods of time, thinking they're protecting themselves. But in the meantime, these gloves are becoming very contaminated on the outside, um, and so. You know, gloves kind of have this false uh, sense of security, and I uh, would suggest that people in the public don't wear gloves when you're proceeding around doing normal activities, and that you rather pack yourself with a hand sanitizer in your pocket and clean your hands frequently. That would be more important to me. Being a flu fighter, so, um, you know, we're coming into flu season. Flu season is not, has not gone away. <laughs> it still comes, just like it normally comes every single year. And it's ever more important right now to be vaccinated against the influenza virus. Um, it is. It would be very unfortunate if we start to um, see people that are co-infected with both, both viruses. So this is your chance to actually prevent the prevent something that you know is vaccine preventable. And also, flu is the same. It, it also has will kill people. So it's very important that you know, we get the flu vaccine because it is something that we can prevent and, and prevent deaths as well. So it's important for all uh, of the public to get their flu shot um, as soon as it becomes available. Um, and then that way decreases the potential for spread of those viruses at the same time. Um, at this, also, it is important because we know that if we have flu circulating in the community and there's a lot of flu circulating, then obviously that's going to increase the number of people that get sick and also need um, hospitalization. So again, we know we've got a vaccine for something that's been around for a long time now. We know it works. We know we want people to get uh, vaccinated. This is your opportunity to get your flu shot. And then of course, uh, lastly, the masks. And so wearing uh, the fabric masks, non-medical grade masks is also that extra barrier in preventing um, the spread of COVID. So all of these things together, I think are very important sort of as a package COVID deal that help you uh, layer up and get suited up against uh, COVID-19. I put this in here because I get so many questions from the public and I think it's worth just mentioning in general. A lot of people ask me, well, why don't we put uh, UV um, in public spaces? Why don't we do mass fogging uh, with disinfectants? That's what this guy here is doing. And then why don't we add um, a lot of extra HEPA filtration everywhere? And so I put this here to say for your information only because I don't think that this is necessary everywhere. I do think it has certain applications where it might be a great augment to a regular cleaning and disinfection program or an augment to a ventilation system that may not be uh, operating as intended as intended or functional. But I don't think that this, these are things that we should be looking at as a general public in regular homes or um, areas uh, that aren't, um, you know, public widespread public spaces. And I, I really don't even think 
that they need to be in very many widespread public areas because all they are is an additional layer of protection. So, um, you know, we, we know that COVID can be cleaned from surfaces using general cleaners and disinfectants. And we do know that that step still has to happen even if you want to use UV or even if you want to fog because the fogging in UV, for example, cannot work by itself. If you don't clean a surface, then those other technologies won't work. So we're just, these are again, just additional things that you can add, but it's just for your information only. And then um, here, lastly, I just wanted to talk briefly about getting tested because I know this is very important. And we wanna make sure that um, those who de demonstrate compatible signs and symptoms um, with COVID are definitely getting tested. Um, uh, if, if public health has asked you to get tested because you've been exposed, that's another important indication. Um, if you suspect that you might have been exposed, say you went to some sort of a gathering or something, we don't want you to get ex tested the day after you've been in, in, in that environment. We do want you to wait at least four to eight days after you've been exposed because that's when we know that the test is most effective. So if you, if you ever do think that you need to get tested, please consider this in mind because um, that's when likely we're able to pick up the virus. We do wanna make sure that you stay home until all your symptoms have resolved. And if you're positive, then that means that you need to stay home for at least 14 days from symptom onset and public health would be in, in, in consultation with you as well. And if you were tested at Sunnybrook, um, Sunnybrook, our infectious disease team has an amazing program in place um, and they follow um, positive individuals with COVID EO. So um, again, it's an augmented service and, and it's fantastic. Um, so those are the things I wanted to convey about testing. And then just a summary slide. Um, we do know that COVID rates are rising um, and a second wave is unpredictable. Um, right now, like I said, I think we're in a slow burn phase, but um, we don't know if the second wave will happen now coming into October um, or later on um, more sort of with the traditional flu season. Um, we want to follow public health guidance regarding minimizing risks. So I talked a lot pretty extensively about all those layering strategies um, and a lot of those layering strategies all come from public health. Uh, so it's important to keep on top of what public health is recommending and um, make sure that we're using as many of those public health measures at all times that we can be and they're not you're not using picking one over another just try and use them as a package um, and then the main message of course is always stay home or get tested if you're symptomatic thank you thanks so much natasha that was great it was a lot of information but uh, I, I think you've organized that really well and you've given us lots to think about and uh, I know it will lead into some of the questions that uh, we've had people submit. I'd now like to introduce you to our next presenter, Dr. Larry Robinson. Dr. Robinson is the Chief of Rehabilitation Services at the St. John's Rehabilitation Program, and he's joining us to discuss rehabilitation strategies. Dr. Robinson, over to you. I think you might be on mute, Dr. Robinson. Sorry about that. Still there you learning go. Zoom. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for asking me to speak today. This is actually my uh, uh, fourth uh, Sunnybrook series uh, that I've been in, uh, involved in. It's a great way to connect with those uh, in, in the public. What I'd like to cover today is the rehabilitation strategies for COVID-19. And what we'll cover, oops, sorry, there we go, are, are the medical impacts of uh, COVID-19 the functional impacts, the rehabilitation strategies after COVID-19, and the impacts on rehabilitation systems. So first, let's talk a little bit about the medical effects of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19, as Natasha uh, said, is a highly infectious disease. Uh, many people actually have relatively mild disease. They can get fever, cough, shortness of breath, and most actually do not require admission to the hospital. Many can, be, uh, can recover at home and don't need to come into the hospital. But some people do have more serious disease. They need to be admitted to the hospital. They may have respiratory and other types of physical dysfunctions, and they may have cognitive and psychological impairments as well. 
there are multiple risk factors. And risk factors doesn't mean that it's certainly going to be uh, more likely to get sick or less likely to get sick. It really doesn't imply certainty. But some of the risk factors are age, diabetes, high blood pressure, and other comorbidities. Uh, certainly, some older people do very well. We've had a number of people that we've just charged from the St. John's Rehab uh, campus of Sunnybrook who've done very well over their, in their 90s. And then some younger people, as you'll see in the news, don't do so well. Uh, and it varies uh, uh, quite a bit for reasons that we don't totally uh, understand. As I said, some people do require a hospital admission. And a sizable proportion, not everyone, requires admission to the intensive care unit. And some of these people who go into the intensive care unit will require mechanical ventilation. Uh, and when you're in the intensive care unit on a ventilator, you're bedridden for many days or even weeks. And this has its own ill effects. The complications of a prolonged immobilization are several. You can have severe muscle weakness and fatigue. Your muscles just uh, start wasting away uh, as you're uh, immobile and fatigue mounts rapidly. You can develop shortness of breath with exertion. So you may not be all that short of breath at rest, but then when you start to move around and walk, you'll develop severe shortness of breath. Joint stiffness can happen. Uh, and also being uh, in a ventilator, uh, immobile for a long time can present its own mental health challenges and depression. And some of these people will have post-traumatic stress disorder because it's been a really traumatic event that they've been through. Uh, some people also have cognitive impairments, what we call delirium, which is an acute uh, cognitive uh, uh, impairment associated with being in the ICU for a prolonged period. We model this on uh, something that we've uh, seen for a number of years, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. That's the model that we use uh, for uh, rehabilitation of patients after severe COVID-19 infection. And the things that you uh, might get after acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome include critical illness or acquired weakness. So these are things like a neuropathy where the nerves are not working normally, or a myopathy where the muscles don't work normally. Uh, and these can take uh, some time to recover. You, one also gets cardiorespiratory deconditioning. So your cardiac and respiratory system are not ready to uh, work the way they normally would and your, pulsing, your resting pulse will be high. You won't have very much endurance. It'll be difficult to uh, do your normal daily activities. Postural instability is common. That's uh, a low blood pressure upon standing and make uh, one dizzy or difficult to get around as well. Cognitive changes can also ensue. Uh, as I said, delirium uh, or co acute cognitive changes can be seen up to 80% of patients in the intensive care unit. And some changes persist even after admission to the ICU. So deficits in memory and attention and some of the higher order executive functions that one might have. These are hard things to treat. And so the focus uh, over the years has been primarily on prevention. Uh, sedate people a little less, try to get people mobile that much earlier and exercise as early as possible, uh, in the, even in the intensive care unit. Now, these are tip, difficult problems to treat in normal times, and the pandemic just hasn't made this any easier. Uh, the pandemic has heightened the impact of all these medical effects and has made it that much more difficult uh, to handle some of these effects. There are economic impacts. People aren't working. It makes it difficult uh, uh, at home. The social and physical distancing and ensuing social isolation also makes it really difficult. Uh, it affects one's mental health and well being. And Dr. Simpson will cover some of this in his talk. Many people just don't want to come to the hospital. They're afraid to come to the hospital because they're afraid of catching uh, COVID 19. Uh, they're afraid of what's going to happen. But as Natasha said, this is one of the safest places to be in terms of all the protective equipment that we have in place. Uh, when people do come to the hospital, they often have to come alone. You can't bring your loved ones with you uh, because we can't admit uh, uh, many other people into the hospital other than the patient. Although there are certain uh, uh, places where we can admit uh, loved ones or uh, family members. The lack of visitors uh, has also made it very difficult. This is a necessary part of uh, prevention of spread of the disease. Uh, but that's made it very difficult uh, for patients in the hospital. And we are adjusting that policy as the pandemic uh, 
uh, either goes up or down. And these, uh, these uh, things all increase fear, isolation, depression, and disorientation. The functional impacts of COVID are, are several. So the medical effects impact function in many areas. Uh, you think about the basic activities of daily living, and these are things like eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, grooming. Uh, these can all be affected. There are also higher level activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living or IADLs. And these are more complex activities such as managing one's finances, uh, transportation, shopping, meals, and uh, laundry. And then mobility is probably one of the most impacted things. Uh, people have difficulty standing, walking, doing stairs, getting out in the community. And that's where inpatient rehabilitation often comes into play is that we will uh, take patients who can't quite go home yet because they can't go up the stairs to get into the house, they can't walk around inside. And uh, the goal is to get them to the point where they are able to go home and thrive. Prehabilitation is also uh, something to think about. And that's the idea of doing rehabilitative interventions before one is exposed to the disease or before one gets sick. And I was really happy that Natasha mentioned cycling because that's my favorite exercise. Uh, so stay healthy now would be the goal there. Uh, this may confer some benefit to prevention either of getting the disease or getting very sick with the disease. Uh, if you think about this in the context of Canadian guidelines for exercise, the guidelines are that we should all be getting about 150 minutes of exercise per week. And this could be uh, various types of exercise, particularly things that uh, we all enjoy. Uh, there's no magic threshold about 150 minutes. So if you're at zero, getting up to 10, 20, or 30 minutes is a real positive. And if you're at 30, getting up to 50 or 60 is a real positive. The more you do, the better. It's a point of diminishing returns. If you're doing 300 minutes, probably going to 320 isn't gonna make as much of a difference, but going from zero to 20 makes a big difference. Uh, we should all try stop smoking if we're smoking, maintain good nutrition uh, and stress reduction where possible. And Dr. Simpson will talk about this some as well. These, these may all offer benefit, particularly to those with pre-existing health conditions uh, in, ter in terms of reducing the severity of uh, infection. So what are some of our rehabilitation strategies after a COVID-19 infection? And we've had a couple of dozen patients at uh, St. John's Rehab uh, who have had uh, our inpatient rehabilitation after getting the infection. We use a multidisciplinary team with a broad range of skills, which will support the biopsychosocial functioning uh, we generally try to start as early as we can. And the focus during rehabilitation is really on function. The goals are individualized. So it depends what people need to do to get home. If they have to get upstairs to get home, there'll be a fair amount of uh, uh, focus on that. Uh, if they have to work on cooking or laundry, we'll focus on those things. So we focus on basic activities of daily living, things like eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, mobility and grooming. Uh, sometimes we teach people to break up their activities so they're not trying to do everything at once uh, because their endurance is not as, uh, as good as it used to be before. Sometimes it's compensatory strategies, figuring out different ways to do things that they used to do one way. And sometimes it's use of assistive equipment like this long handled reacher that I show here. There are also more uh, complex activities, the instrumental activities of daily living. And these are things like managing finances, transportation, shopping, meals, and laundry. Uh, and those uh, take a bit more work uh, to get up to speed. We also work on respiratory rehabilitation after COVID because the COVID-19 virus uh, has a huge impact on the respiratory system. And the goals of respiratory rehabilitation are to reduce shortness of breath, reduce anxiety, and improve endurance and fitness. These are the big goals that we're after. Uh, here again, we use uh, individualized, personalized goals uh, that take into account what the patient needs to do to get home and also any other illnesses or complications that may coexist in the patient. The specific techniques are several. They include things like diaphragmatic training and there are exercises we can use to strengthen one's diaphragm. Respiratory muscle training and some of this is uh, strengthening not only the diaphragm but there are a number of other muscles that participate in respiration that can be strengthened. Uh, coughing exercises, and one can learn how to cough more effectively and clear sputum more effectively. Stretching exercises, which is, improves one's function and also uh, flexibility. 
Uh, one thing that we can all do at home, uh, uh, not only in the hospital, but at home is aerobic exercises. And these can be things like walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, and gradually increasing the intensity and even the duration of exercise. It's good to think about this as three to five times per week for 20 or 30 minutes uh, each time uh, for exercise. Another thing one can do is progressive resistive exercises. So here I mean weight training. And what we uh, typically do classically is find a weight that we can do 10 times, but just barely 10 times and do this uh, repetitively two to three times per week. And one will find that you can often increase by five or 10% uh, in terms of the weight that you use uh, each week. And then balance training is also helpful. There it's helpful to have a, a trained physiotherapist to help with your balance. You don't necessarily wanna do this on your own. We also teach people to, uh, uh, in, in their breathing, to slow down their breathing, mobilize other breathing muscles besides only the diaphragm, and that'll help them to more effectively uh, uh, breathe uh, during exercise. There have been a number of impacts on the rehabilitation system uh, that I should mention as well. And so it, this uh, has had a significant impact on how we, how we provide therapy. Uh, one thing is for patients with COVID, sometimes we're uh, restricted to exercise in the room and bedside treatments because we can't have people walk through the hospital because of the risks of infection to others. Uh, we have uh, developed separate uh, rehabilitation units for COVID patients so that we can minimize the risk of transmission, also minimize the use of personal protective equipment. Uh, group therapy becomes limited uh, in the setting of COVID-19 uh, because uh, you can't, you're really worried about the transmission of disease. Group therapy is generally very effective. It gives people a peer to work with, but here uh, we can't really do it as effectively. Uh, and of course, even though COVID-19 presents uh, patients with disability, the other types of patients with disability are still there, whether it's stroke or spinal cord injury or head injury. So this uh, creates some stress on our system. Uh, we have had uh, uh, health care healthcare practitioner fears play a role too, as we develop uh, rehabilitation programs for COVID patients. Uh, we, uh, all the hospital leadership has to work with healthcare practitioners to make sure they feel safe and protected. And also there are delays in access, especially for routine and preventive care where people just really don't wanna to come to the hospital and also the access is uh, delayed. The disabled are, quite affected and probably more uh, affected than the non-disabled population because it is more difficult to get here. Uh, we have adopted virtual care. Uh, so this involves uh, virtual uh, uh, physician visits, but also virtual uh, uh, therapy visits like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, perhaps a, a bit of a success from the pandemic and something that we've learned to do this will no doubt be part of future care. I think uh, patients uh, really love uh, virtual care because they don't have to leave their home. Uh, the travel uh, is difficult, travel is difficult for someone without a disability, but once one has a disability, it's even that much more difficult. Uh, and so there are many advantages to virtual care. There are also disadvantages. We can't do hands-on therapy. We, we don't have the same level of interaction that we would normally have. So in summary, uh, I just want to mention COVID-19 infection is serious. Many people will uh, have a self-limited disease, but a small proportion will have very serious illness. Prevention is key. Paying attention to those things that Natasha mentioned earlier is really important. Many who are sick recover uh, completely. A small proportion become uh, quite sick, and some of these do require inpatient rehabilitation. Uh, what can you do? I think prevention, again, is key, preventing the infection, prehabilitation, staying as healthy as you can now, exercise, stopping smoking, good nutrition, stress reduction. Those are all great things to do now uh, uh, for protecting yourself uh, for future infection. And uh, if, those, uh, if you are affected by COVID-19, many people will wanna work on aerobic and resistance exercises to build strength and endurance and get back to a, uh, a more normal lifestyle. Some may ultimately require uh, rehabilitation services to do this. Uh, many can uh, do this on their own. So I wanna thank you for uh, uh, having me talk tonight and I'd be glad uh, when we uh, get to questions to answer questions on this area. Thanks so much, Larry. Uh, just a rem reminder, um, as Larry mentioned about questions, 
reminded everyone watching to please send us any questions. If you have them, you can send them through the website. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Robert Simpson. Uh, Dr. Simpson is a physiatrist at the St. John's Rehab Hospital site of Sunnybrook. Dr. Simpson is here to present on managing stress and practicing mindfulness. I'll turn the microphone now over to him. Thanks very much, Dr. Cass. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to join the panel discussion. Uh, so, uh, like Professor Robinson, I'm also a, a, a physiatrist, a rehabilitation physician, uh, and I'm going to talk about something called mindfulness uh, and, and what sort of role mindfulness might have uh, during the pandemic or for people who've been affected by COVID-19. In terms of what I'm going to cover, I'll start by uh, talking about what, what do we mean by mindfulness in terms of definitions. Uh, I'll then talk more specifically about something called mindfulness-based interventions, uh, and then move on to talk about the theory and the science behind these uh, treatments uh, in terms of understanding how they might work. Uh, I'll then talk about how they're used in a clinical environment in terms of their safety, uh, how patients experience taking part in these interventions, talk a little bit about are they effective or not, uh, and then with specific reference to uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'll finish up uh, making some recommendations about what to look for uh, if you decide that you want to learn more about mindfulness uh, and then uh, finish with a summary before I think we're going to move on to the questions. So my, mindfulness uh, has its roots in ancient Buddhist and yogic meditation practices and um, if we look at the Pali language, uh, the closest uh, translation we have to the English word mindfulness uh, is sati uh, samprayana, which uh, roughly translates as to transcend suffering via clear comprehension through awareness. And you'll notice I've underli underlined transcend suffering, um, which I think is obviously interesting because we're talking about mindfulness in relation to, to health. And often when people are unhealthy, there's a focus on trying to alleviate suffering. But there are actually at least 18 different uh, theoretical models for, for mindfulness. And this can be looked at from a Buddhist, a psychological, and more recently a neuroscientific perspective. But in terms of what we mean in, in the health environment, what we're talking about is uh, something called a mindfulness-based intervention. Uh, and these are treatments that were introduced into North American healthcare in the late 1970s by John Kabat-Zinn. And he defines mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. In terms of the major mindfulness-based interventions, uh, the first intervention uh, that John Kabat-Zinn introduced has become widely recognized as mindfulness-based stress reduction. And as the name suggests, there's a focus on reducing stress. Uh, MBSR is uh, typically delivered as a group program, uh, and it was originally developed for helping people with chronic med medical conditions manage the stresses uh, and pain that's often associated with these conditions. It is typically delivered over uh, eight weekly, two and a half hour in sessions, typically face-to-face, -face, but now, uh, as, as you're here, it, it's, it's increasingly done uh, by virtual means. Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction also comes with a fairly significant uh, commitment. Uh, taking part in the course is recommended to practice the meditations each day in between the class for up to about 45 minutes a day. And that amounts to quite a large dose over time. Uh, there are certain core meditations included in MBSR, and these include the so-called body scan, sitting practice or breath awareness, uh, and hatha yoga postures. Uh, and there's a fairly significant part of the course that's, de course that's dedicated towards uh, psychoeducation material about the science of stress uh, and something called a group inquiry uh, and discussion. And the inquiry relates to something that's uh, quite specific for mindfulness-based interventions in terms of the type of questions that are asked uh, of individuals' experience about the meditation practices uh, 
in that sense, they're premeditated and they're designed to, to draw out aspects of experience that are useful teaching points for other individuals in the class. So there's an aspect of the course that, that the learning actually takes place in the group environment. Uh, a derivative of mindfulness-based stress reduction is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And this is something that was developed about 20 years later, around the uh, 2000s. Uh, and this was developed specifically to address uh, recurrent depression. Uh, and it took the, the basis of mindfulness-based stress reduction and added in elements that focused on factors that were known to contribute to recurrent episodes of depression. So there's a more, uh, there's more, there's more time dedicated towards aspects of cognition and uh, negative uh, emotional states. Uh, aside from that though, it's very similar to mindfulness-based stress reduction. Again, delivered over eight weeks, uh, daily home practice, about the same time, 45 minutes daily, possibly a little less in the way of uh, yoga postures. So about these meditation practices, what do they involve? Well, the body scan, um, as the image suggests, is typically done in a lying position, can also be done sitting, could, could be done standing. It, 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 the lying or the sitting is really to facilitate a comfort over a prolonged period of time. And put very simply, what happens during the body scan is that this is a guided meditation. So the course instructor would take you through a set of instructions to shift your attention uh, from one area of the body uh, to another in a sequential fashion. So you might start with your right hand and after a few minutes of exploring your experiences there with, with, uh, with guidance from the teacher, you would then move on to your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, and so on until you'd work through each part of the body. And probably, it probably has its roots in uh, yoga practices in this, uh, similar practices uh, in yoga. The sitting practice, that, this is another of the core meditation practices in mindfulness-based interventions. As the name suggests, typically uh, practiced in a sitting position, but uh, it, again, it's not essential that it's done in a sitting position. And you can see some of the traditional yoga postures there, the, the so-called lotus posture, and so on. Um, the essence of the sitting practice is simply focus on the sensations of breathing. Uh, and unlike other meditation practices, uh, such as pranayama or some of the uh, practices within Qigong, uh, there's no attempt to alter the breathing pattern in any way. And the other major meditative component of mindfulness-based interventions is so-called mindful movement. Uh, and that takes a variety of different forms, including mindful walking uh, for those uh, use a wheelchair, a mindful wheeling. Um, and essentially these are adapted Hatha yoga postures. Sometimes you see uh, Tai Chi as a, as, a, as a surrogate, sometimes you see Qi, uh, Qigong postures. Uh, and although it says it's Hatha yoga, as the image is meant to depict, uh, this is not about advanced levels of agility and balance, putting your body into all sorts of contortions. It's really just about exploring your experience, uh, the sensations of your body in a, in a set of postures that, that place your body in a different position. Um, so they really should be accessible for, for, for everybody who's, who's coming along to the course. And the courses typically do have a range of ability levels from that point of view. How do these interventions work? Well, as I said, there are a multitude of uh, theories underlying mindfulness-based interventions. And I think the simplest and most useful from my point of view in terms of trying to convey what's going on uh, is the one outlined by Shona Shapiro and colleagues. Uh, and essentially it's, it's known as intention, attention, attitude. Uh, that those meaning uh, setting a clear intention uh, in your mind in terms of why you're doing the practice. So then paying attention to your experiences. This is the real core of mindfulness practices uh, in that you're training your attentional systems. Um, and those experiences relate to your immediate environment, the sensations in your body, your thoughts, and your emotions. And finally, within this model, it's recommended that you're attempting to cultivate an attitude of openness and curiosity towards your experiences. 
for example, noticing if there's any judgment or self-criticism implicit in your, your uh, normal ways of responding. Um, and over time, uh, and again, this is where the, the sort of uh, taking the lead from the, the teaching component is really important, developing a sense of compassion uh, and kindness towards yourself uh, in response to those experiences. If we look at the scientific evidence, um, then particularly looking at the types of studies that are thought of within scientific circles as being the uh, highest quality or having the lowest risk of researcher bias. Um, and we start to break down, if people say they're feeling better, what are the factors that make the difference? Then there's pretty robust evidence to say that, that these changes are mediated by uh, reductions in how reactive we are, both towards our thoughts and to, towards our emotions. Um, and there's also good quality evidence that becoming more mindful in terms of the construct uh, is associated uh, with beneficial outcomes. So it's correlated closely with reductions in stress, reductions in depression, reductions in, in anxiety, these sorts of things. The amount of home practice also matters too. The more you practice, the better the outcomes. Um, and that links to a, an interesting literature. You'll notice I've not underlined the, the bottom three there, and that's because I don't think these are as clear cut, but there are certainly very interesting uh, studies. And again, these are systematic reviews, meta-analysis, so high quality studies that demonstrate through the practice of mindfulness, there are associated changes in both the activation uh, and eventually the structure of the brain, uh, which is perhaps not surprising because we know that the brain is an adaptive organ and it and it adapts in response to to what we do and what we're uh, what what we're confronted with. There's also interesting uh, evidence again from systematic reviews meta analysis that. Practicing mindfulness is associated with lower uh, biomarkers of stress, things like lowered cortisol, lowered heart rate, lowered blood pressure. Uh, and also, interestingly, alterations in the immune inflammatory profile. Uh, and again, this is, you know, this is preliminary evidence. It's, it's definitely not um, compelling evidence, but there's, the, there's certainly evidence that we see changes in the immune cell transcription factors. Uh, things like C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation, cell-mediated immunity, and cellular aging in terms of telomeres. A big question for any type of intervention, any type of treatment that we're recommending for our patients, we have to know, uh, is it safe? And again, if we look at the systematic reviews, so these are the types of studies that include only those studies with the lowest risk of research bias, well, they suggest that mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy are safe. However, we have to remember that that's limited by the reporting quality of the trials. So if people don't report on adverse reactions, we don't know about them. Okay. However, if we look at case reports, so that's more like individual studies of people in a variety of different settings, it's sensible to say that if someone's got a psychotic disorder, then specialist psychiatric advice would be indicated if you're considering a mindfulness intervention. And that being said, there's actually quite good uh, quality evidence that mindfulness can be helpful for people with psychosis. But again, I would emphasize strongly, I think that would have to be uh, in cohort with a, with a psychiatrist. Uh, and I think if somebody's suicidal, then mindfulness shouldn't be the focus uh, and it should be on safety. So what do patients say? Uh, what's it like for, for a patient to take part uh, in this health intervention and a mindfulness-based intervention? Well, this is a, a, a review of qualitative studies from 2012, which I think presents uh, a, a, nice, uh, a, a nice overview of what happens. And essentially it breaks down into three phases. The first phase being that coming along to the mindfulness course and starting to learn the practices people start to recognize aspects of their experience uh, and their habitual ways of responding that are actually unhelpful in terms of their well-being. Uh, and that as time passes and as they continue to practice, that transitions into a second phase where people are starting to feel equipped uh, through having the meditation practices and the, the education that they've received 
to start uh, addressing some of the difficulties they're experiencing uh, in a way where they feel safer, they, f they feel more competent. Uh, and then finally, uh, moving into a phase, phase three, um, where there's a real sort of sense of uh, personal mastery uh, in terms of completing the course, uh, being able to describe the different interventions, being able to pra practice the different meditation practices, uh, and move, moving on uh, to use these uh, in, in daily life. And that's associated with uh, constructs like an increased sense of agency or control over uh, what's happening uh, and increased self-efficacy in terms of uh, feeling more confident about dealing with difficulties that you might be presented with in life. Uh, another big question for, for us to answer to, to, to our patients, if we're recommending these treatments, are they actually, are they actually effective? Uh, and again, high quality evidence from systematic reviews and meta-analysis that these interventions improve stress, anxiety, recurrent depression, post-traumatic stress, fatigue. I'm sure you've picked up from the, the preceding talks that these are common issues uh, in the context of COVID-19. Other issues, again, uh, not as high quality evidence, but, but, but you know, fairly good quality evidence, so nonetheless, that mindfulness-based interventions help improve aspects of cognition. Uh, so memory function, uh, so-called meta-awareness, uh, which is a, a function uh, within cognition of uh, being aware of, being able to monitor uh, aspects of your experience. Uh, cognitive flexibility, again, that fits with the findings I mentioned previously. Also, interestingly, in terms of sleep quality, uh, there's quite good quality evidence for, for mindfulness interventions to improve sleep. Uh, and there's, there's some evidence that mindfulness helps people who've got chronic painful conditions, uh, although, again, that's not compelling evidence. So what about in the context of COVID-19? I think it's important to remember that COVID-19 is a a fairly new condition in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and for that reason, uh, just the way research tends to, to function, the research world functions, that, that there hasn't been a lot of studies that have assessed the impact of mindfulness interventions directly on people who've been affected with uh, COVID-19. Um, but what we can say, of course, is that we know on a population level around the world, we're seeing unprecedented high levels of stress, health anxiety, social isolation. Uh, as Professor Robinson mentioned, uh, for patients who've been admitted to the ICU with a COVID uh, infection or had a prolonged period of hospitalization, uh, there's a high likelihood of multiple and complex impairments across domains, including physical function, mental function, social function. The studies that have been published, and there are about 12 studies ongoing at the moment, but there's only a few studies that have published findings. They've either taken a survey methodology, so they've asked people in a sort of snapshot fashion about their level of mindfulness, their level of stress, so on, and they've examined other links between if someone's more mindfulness, are they less stressed? Uh, and they tend to suggest that having a higher level of trait mindfulness um, or being more predisposed to being uh, a mindful person, if you like, uh, confers a degree of protection for stress during the pandemic. Uh, there's also some evidence uh, from patient groups that practicing mindfulness during the pandemic leads to reduced stress uh, and also to less anxiety and improved sleep. So I think in summary, that evidence for mindfulness following COVID-19 infection is still quite preliminary, but I think it's a reasonable assumption to say it's likely to be, help, be helpful for, for quite a few people. So if, you're, if you feel stressed, which I think most people do at the moment, um, and you're thinking about accessing some form of treatment uh, to help you deal with that, uh, if you're thinking about mindfulness-based intervention, I think it's important to consider who, who you train with and the reason I say that is because if you Google mindfulness or you Google mindfulness Toronto, for example, you'll get about a million different hits on Google. Um, and mindfulness is very widely available. It's available uh, on the internet in terms of pre-recorded sessions. There are mindfulness apps. 
Uh, there are all sorts of different mindfulness interventions in the community. Uh, and I'd just like to emphasize that what I'm referring to is uh, mindfulness-based interventions in the healthcare context, context. And I suggest if you're keen on uh, trying mindfulness, seeing if you like it, uh, then ask who is the instructor? Uh, for example, what, what sort of training have they had? In the UK, when mindfulness, when the evidence base for mindfulness uh, reached a stage where there was good quality evidence, uh, it was suggested it should be rolled out uh, en masse. And unfortunately, what happened was that a lot of people within, professionals within the health service were trained in a day to teach mindfulness. Uh, and that's just not appropriate. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is look for, look for someone who's been trained via a, a, a reputable institution. Uh, uh, look for the length of the training. Typically it's recommended about a year's training before somebody teaches mindfulness. Um, and think about which approach, like for example, if your symptoms are mainly stress, I would say mindfulness-based stress reduction. If you've got recurrent episodes of depression, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy might be better. Check that the person's got certification to teach. If you've got a particular health condition, ask if they've got experience in dealing with that health condition. Uh, and one of the good practice recommendations for teachers is that they should have their own daily personal practice and they should be supervised by an experienced supervisor. In terms of the courses, MBSR and MPCT are the best evidence. Both of them typically come with an introductory session uh, and that can be an opportunity to go to a class or, or to attend a class and see if that uh, is something you like or not. And some of these interventions also pre-screen. Uh, now, I'll just pop, pop something in here that I should have said earlier. Mindfulness-based interventions, as I said, are typically delivered face-to-face, -face, but there's equally good evidence that they're effective online. And now you'll find that you won't be able to find a face-to-face, -face, nor would you want to go to a face-to-face -face class at the moment. What, we're, what I'm talking about is, uh, is virtual mindfulness sessions. Again, virtual MBSR or MBCT. And I think probably a good piece of advice you know, in terms of your local area, trying to find out reputable providers, uh, I would suggest discuss with your family physician because they're likely to know. So just to summarize, mindfulness can be defined in a variety of different ways. Um, what I've been speaking about is mindfulness-based interventions, of which MBSR and MBCT are the most widely used with the best quality evidence. They're thought to work by reducing how, we react, how reactive we are to, to our thinking and to our emotional experience, particularly aversive experiences. Um, they're generally considered to be safe. They've got good quality evidence in certain areas, but they're not a treatment for everything. Uh, and uh, best learned, uh, via suitably trained, certified and experienced facilitator. Just like to thank everyone very much for listening. Robert, thank you so much for that. That was, uh, that was a very interesting trip through uh, mindfulness-based interventions and how they might apply uh, both to, to those during the time of the pandemic, but more broadly for, for all of us as, as a method of stress reduction. So thank you for that. So that concludes the formal presentations. And we've got uh, about half an hour left uh, in the evening that we can uh, take some of your questions. So uh, a number of you have submitted questions either before this evening or online uh, through the web uh, portal. So I'm going to try and make my way through as many of these as we can. Um, some of these I think may have been covered by our, our presenters. So if so, I might touch on them briefly and we might just harken back to the presentations that we've already had. Um, Natasha, not surprisingly, a lot of them are, are going to come to you, but I will try and spread them around to all of our presenters. But uh, as, as is often the case, people have a lot of questions about the infection prevention aspects. Um, so a couple of things related, just related to uh, masks and use of masks, and you, you've covered some of this uh, well, but there's a couple of specific uh, questions that uh, have arisen. So one, uh, one person writes, I feel anxious when I do things like walk my dog in a quiet neighborhood and a cyclist or a runner goes past quickly. Neither of us may be wearing our masks outside. What's the risk of getting COVID-19 in a situation like that? Yep, that's a great question. I think that that's where your risk is significantly low. Um, again, if you think back a little bit to the presentation I gave and delivered, it's really, if you, your contact is so short and brief, uh, again, the, 
the, vi the potential for virus to be in the air at the same time that you're passing by is, is very remote and very unlikely, especially if someone's not actually symptomatic or sick to begin with. So I think um, the chance there is quite low and I, I, I certainly feel very comfortable um, going outside for uh, my runs regularly and, and without any question, I'm not wearing a mask. Uh, again, mentally, I'm trying to keep physically distancing. Again, keeping that layering strategy as much as possible in place um, wherever possible is important. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that definitely, I certainly wear a mask even when I'm exercising, when I have a concern that I'm not able to um, physically distance. And so I think those are important things to remember. Thank you. Um, you. You touched on some of the different types of masks. So the question really is, what, what are the estimated percentages or, or sense of how well each type N95 surgical mask, cloth mask, how well they will they protect you? Yeah, for sure. The, you know, the mask efficiency, especially for healthcare um, masks are rated um, and approved uh, and given, you know, certain accrediting bodies or ASTM, for example, uh, make sure that they're um, performing to the ability ability that they're expected to perform to. So an N95 mask is a good example. It's supposed to filter at least 95% uh, percent of particulates. And so that's that's an important piece that remains important to any kinds of masks that are used in healthcare. We always want to make sure they've been appropriately um, rated and that um, they're healthcare quality uh, masks. Uh, what we're using outside and in, in the public um, is our fabric masks. And this is where there's a lot more uncertainty with how much um, they can necessarily prevent um, you acquiring COVID. They certainly act to do what they're intended to do, which is to try and contain secretion. So if we're all wearing them correctly, as, as was kind of illustrated in, that, in those pictures where we had um, several people either with a mask or not without a mask, you, you know, the more you're, we're containing your secretions, the less likely that they're going to be floating and, and through the air and um, in contact with others. So, you know, just making sure that we're following the public health recommendations again with the double layering of the mask. I think that's important for the fabric masks, but otherwise it, it's, it is still very hard for us to say um, how much our percentages decrease. And that's exactly why in that poster that I showed you, I erased those percentages because there's no scientific evidence behind them right now. Um, so it's, it's important to try and do as best as we can, but again, we don't have those defined percentages yet. Okay. Um, continuing on this theme, um, there's obviously lots of concern about schools going back and especially concern about risks to teachers. Um, so there's a question around, um, will, will mask and face shield protect teachers who have students when the students aren't wearing masks? So for instance, if they have some medical reason they can't wear masks, or if they're playing instruments, for instance, in, in the classroom, and I'm not sure if they're playing instruments or if that's, uh, that's happening or not happening in our, in our schools, but um, just sort of what, what's, the, what's the risk of working with unmasked students? Yeah, so I think um, that's a big question. I know that the schools I've, I've heard about this already have been um, some, uh, you know, part of their curriculum is uh, a very sophisticated um, choir and um, and instrumental group, which includes, you know, things like wind instruments, which I think is the primary concern as well as singing. Um, you know, let me first touch on the fact that I do think that, um, I, like, I, I, I know that I personally have provided support to my own children's school, and I know that, um, you know, they've been given the proper equipment, the proper PPE um, to be able to um, properly protect themselves. So wearing, again, their, in their case, uh, I believe, at least with this school, had uh, received medical grade masks. They're also given face shields. So certainly I think they're protected. They're no different than um, in that case as our own healthcare workers who are in direct contact with uh, symptomatic individuals with COVID providing direct close contact and very well protected. Um, but having said, you know, like not, and, and again, in that case here, if you wanna compare that, we don't ask our, our patients um, in, in hospital to some of the most of them cannot tolerate wearing a mask to prevent secretions because that's why they're here. They're here because they're really sick and adding a mask to them would it would compromise their own health even further. So again, we have people that are wearing um, proper uh, masks and visors and are in close contact 
providing direct care and they are completely fine and we haven't seen transmission. So, you know, that from that perspective, I think that's great. Um, we also have to remember it's for the great, like we have to think about for the greater good. So I, I always think of it, if people are, some people are familiar with the term herd immunity. So getting a lot of people vaccinated, the more people we vaccinate, the more likely we are, less likely we are to um, transmit that organism, whether it be, you know, measles, whether it be uh, flu or anything else, that herd immunity. I like to call this COVID thing kind of like community um, COVID practices, uh, herd immunity. So the more people we get on board with wearing their masks, wearing and prop properly protecting themselves and others, the more likely we are to be preventing transmission. For the one person that may not be able to wear their mask, you know, again, you have to think, what's the likelihood that they even have COVID? And then on top of that, there's so many people that are being protected around them, it's creating sort of a bubble. So those are things to keep in mind if, if you have, as a teacher in a setting, um, you're, you do have PPE that um, is there to protect you. And I, if students are definitely um, being asked to wear their masks and where they don't, I think that you're, you're again, you're not at great risk. Um, again, if you reflect a little bit on my prevalence rates, the children have been notoriously known as the smaller group um, and haven't been contributing significantly um, to COVID spread. So, I mean, we'll see where that goes. The schools are open, but um, for now, those are things to keep in mind. Well, I'll ask you one more and then I'll uh, give you a bit of a break. Um, and it sort of follows on a little bit to the last question. So what, what do we know about the risk of playing an instrument such as in an orchestra? The writer says, I play a brass instrument and I've had conflicting information about the risk. So, there, there, I mean, I think um, I have looked at some of the information around that, and it, it, there's, it's, a, I know singing is one of the things that um, there's greatest risk uh, with COVID, and there has been um, COVID transmission in choirs. It's demonstrated through singing, so I think that's an important one to keep in the back of our minds. But when it comes to wind instruments and other kinds of instruments, I think we have, uh, we don't, we haven't seen that there's been transmission. But in saying that, we, you know. I think a lot of um, different kinds of strategies have been put in place. So there's a lot more people still playing these instruments at home and through Zoom. Um, and, and in addition to that, I know that there's also um, individuals that are looking at protecting sort of or creating masks for um, some wind instruments that can cover um, and prevent some of the secretions from coming out of them. And so I think there's still a lot to be learned here. I don't think we can give a definitive answer on all this. I think as, um, was mentioned things even in schools are just slowly starting to ramp up when it comes to musical instruments um, just because we're being cautious especially around anything that will generate any kinds of uh, extra velocity from our mouths um, into instruments flutes clarinets all kinds of different things as well yep. thank you um, there's a couple of questions that are similar so i'm going to take the chair's prerogative and combine them a little bit so uh, a couple of questions how can one nicely ask someone to put their mask on properly or take a couple of steps back without causing undue conflict? And in a kind of related way, what's the best way to deal with COVID naysayers? So uh, I think we've all been in the circumstance where we encounter people who either don't accept that the pandemic is, is here or don't accept that the danger is what we believe it to be. I think it's being inflated for different reasons. Um, and I think we've encountered situations where people aren't wearing masks or are standing too close. You know, I, I, I don't know if there's a right answer. I guess my general advice would be um, it's okay to remind people in a, in a polite, non-intrusive way. Um, I've, uh, what I've seen some people do is they carry an extra couple of, uh, of surgical masks if they, if they have them uh, and just politely say, oh, you, know, you don't have a mask. Can I, can I offer you one? Did you forget your mask? Sometimes that's, that's gratefully accepted. Um, or, or saying, you know, I, I, you know, I feel more comfortable if we stood a little further apart with some social distancing. Um, I, the majority of people have either forgotten to put their mask on or don't realize that it's not covering their nose and, and they take it well. Uh, you know, I think there's a small minority of people who, who maybe uh, are, are not willing to hear that. And my, I guess my advice would be just, just don't engage and disengage and, you know, remove yourself from the situation if you can. Uh, rather than sort of pushing the conflict. Um, people's tempers are short and, you know, as we've heard, people are under a lot of stress. No one, no one knows what someone else is, uh, is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and you don't want to be some, uh, 
uh, part of the part of the issue that sets them off and leads to a, a more difficult conflict. And certainly, if we've learned nothing else, someone standing there without a mask screaming at you is not going to be a good thing for you. So uh, I, I guess I would say gently, gently take a shot at, at uh, asking them to to comply and otherwise uh, remove yourself from the danger. A um, couple other questions. When will there be a reliable vaccine available for Canadians? I think if anyone tells you a definitive answer, they're making it up. Uh, there are so many steps involved in bringing a new vaccine to market and there is promising work going on in a number of different countries and a number of different labs. And we're hoping that, that one or more of them pan out, but it's a complicated process to, to balance the need to move quickly with the need for rigorous testing. Uh, and it needs to go through multiple stages before it's used in humans. So, you know, the short answer is not soon, not this fall. Uh, I don't think anyone's thinking there will be one available at the, in the time that you get your flu shot. Um, but, but time beyond that, it's hard to know. Depends really on how the trials for the vaccines uh, go. Um, and the other sort of related question, and, and Tasha did touch on this, do pneumonia and or flu vaccines mitigate the risk of COVID-19? So the answer is no, but. So it's not gonna prevent you from getting COVID-19. There's no sort of cross protection, but we know that first of all, the last thing you wanna do is be contracting a febrile respiratory illness in the setting of COVID. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is be transmitting those diseases to others who might be immunocompromised. And certainly if someone has an infection, they are at greater risk for contracting other infections and get, be, being co-infected. So for all of those reasons, I think this is a, a season beyond any other when I would really strongly advise people to get their influenza vaccine, uh, get any of the, of the preventable illness strategies that Natasha talked about, that layering effect, uh, and try and keep yourself healthy, and importantly, keep other people healthy. Um, a few questions for Robert related to, to his topic. Um, I feel like my baseline stress levels of stress are higher now, and that's affecting my sleep. Any specific tips for me? Yeah, I think um, I think that's probably very common. I think it's affecting a lot of people just now. Um, obviously, I've been uh, talking about mindfulness-based interventions, and they do they do have a, an evidence base to support that they are uh, they, they will help some people. Um, there are other there are other treatments that can be helpful. Uh, cognitive behavioural therapy has got good quality evidence for for sleep disorders. Um, I think, generally speaking, it's helpful to normalise the fact that many of us are probably not sleeping well just now because the, the baseline levels of stress are so much higher all round. Um, and simple sleep strategies still continue to apply. Uh, thinking about uh, trying to have a regular sleeping pattern, trying to have a regular routine that you follow, uh, trying to minimise the amount of exposure you have to blue light, for example, your your, your cell phone, iPad, television, try, try to minimise uh, the amount of exposure you have to that after, say, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Um, avoid caffeine after 6 o'clock in the evening, these sorts of things. Um, and as Professor Robinson uh, mentioned, you know, it applies in any, uh, you know, whether you see yourself as healthy or not, try, trying to get, take good care of your general health is also important for your sleep too. Um, so trying to make sure that you're eating a balanced diet and that you're uh, taking steps to, to proactively manage stress as best you can. And that can mean things like um, spending time uh, doing things that you enjoy, uh, your hobbies, if you can, if you're still able to do them during the pandemic, or if you're not and, and finding something else that you can enjoy. Uh, spending time connecting with friends and family, loved ones, even if, even if it's done remotely. Uh, we know that social supports are a very, very important uh, mediator of, 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 uh, of, of good mental health. Um, and that, all these types of different strategies, I think, should feed into a, a, a creating better circumstances for you to fall asleep naturally. Thanks, Robert. Um, you, you led into another question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and answer it because you started to. Um, so the question was, how important is peer-to-peer -peer support, especially if the person or loved one has been diagnosed with COVID? Um, and uh, a related question was, what tools are there to help people connect safely during the pandemic? So I can certainly speak to a couple. 
um, we've had great success here at Sunnybrook, and I know other, other institutions have done similar programs of deploying iPads and devices that have uh, applications like FaceTime that are allowing people that are, that are in isolation, either with a diagnosis of COVID or, or, or suspected of having COVID and waiting for their test results to come back, uh, allowing them to connect face to face with with friends and family and those that provide support and we know that that support is really important it's important anytime someone's um, experiencing illness and and even more isolating at a time like this to, during the pandemic so uh, there are methods that have done that um, and and uh, a couple of people have mentioned tonight about using virtual care uh, and Natasha mentioned the the um, covidio uh, program which is really just uh, a video program like this, like using Zoom, where your specialist talks to you while you're at home and asks about symptoms and they can look at you and see how you look. Uh, we, we've deployed uh, little portable oxygen monitors to people so we can look at their oxygen saturations at home, etc. So there's ways of connecting not just to friends and family, but also to your medical providers in a way that's safe for you and safe for everyone else too. Um, Robert, another question for you. Uh, how can I determine if MBI would be beneficial for me? Is there a referral process to experts at Sunnybrook like this for this? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, I think I think the simplest way, if we're thinking about it from a health perspective, is to speak to your family doctor uh, and ask your family doctor if they think that mindfulness would be beneficial for you based on your what they know of you personally, uh, what they know of you in terms of your your, your medical uh, history. Um, as I covered in the talk, the mindfulness has got quite good quality evidence for a variety of different conditions, a variety of different conditions that, that affect all, all of us at different points in our life commonly. So, for example, things like stress, anxiety. Um, also, if you, if you have a, a, a long-term health condition, it's widely recognised that living with long-term health conditions can be a stressful experience. Uh, and there's certainly an accumulating evidence base that mindfulness-based interventions can be beneficial uh, in those type of circumstances. I think, though, if you if you want to access uh, mindfulness via Sunnybrook, and there are uh, people who are uh, taking mindfulness courses on a regular basis at Sunnybrook, um, then the best uh, route would be through your family doctor with a referral to the psychiatry service, specifically requesting um, a, a mindfulness-based intervention, and I think that your your primary care provider would really act as the gatekeeper there for you uh, with regards to whether it's uh, likely to be beneficial for you or not. Um, and you know, thinking about some of those considerations that I mentioned in terms of there are circumstances where it's it's probably not the right thing for somebody, uh, and it's good it's good to run run your ideas past your health provider before proceeding. Great, thank you. Um, Larry, a couple of uh, a couple of questions related to rehab. Um, how can I rebuild my strength after having COVID or having the seasonal flu? You talked a little bit about this in your talk, but let me just sort of amplify a little bit of what people can do if they have been uh, ill and they're trying to regain their strength. That's a great question, and I think the two big areas to focus on are strength and aerobic capacity. So. Uh, aerobic capacity, maybe let's start with that first. And that gets to the 150 minutes of exercise per week or do as much as you can. Uh, and those are things like walking, running, swimming, cycling, things that uh, you feel like you can keep up on a regular basis. It's often, often the hardest part is just keeping it going. And so if you pick something that you like doing, that's gonna be a lot easier to keep going than if you pick something you don't like. So just gradually two to three, four or five times a week, uh, try to do a little bit extra walking, a little bit of cycling or swimming. There are great places to do this right now and increase that each week. The strength part is really weights. And uh, uh, I know we can't use gyms the same way as we used to in the past, but there are home weights you can use and try to gradually increase the weights that you're able to, to do. So it's strength and uh, endurance, the two things I would focus on. Thanks, Larry. Uh, another question, is home rehab as effective as what's offered in the hospital? Uh, that's a great question. So I think it depends. So some types of rehab really need hands-on uh, therapy. So uh, say massage of a complicated scar after a burn injury 
or assessment of balance, those might uh, those are better off in person. And we do have uh, in-person therapy occurring at St. John's, for example. But there are the types that it might actually be better at home. Uh, one of the big things about therapy is that it's not just the time you spend with a the therapist that's important. It's the exercise you do in between therapy sessions. So if you're trying to strengthen, if you just do it a couple of times a week with a the therapist, that's not going to get you there very fast. But if you can do it every day at home, strengthening, stretching, whatever the uh, exercise is, it's a lot more effective. Uh, and if it's a choice between not seeing therapy or seeing someone at home, the home therapy can be very effective. Uh, there is always the risk, of course, with any virtual care that you're missing something on the physical exam or missing something you would see in person. But in general, uh, uh, at-home therapy is quite effective. Thanks, Larry. Okay, we've got about eight minutes left before I wrap up. Natasha, I've got a few. We're going to do them as real short snappers. So I will, I will give you a question and, and we can give a, a brief answer because some of them we've actually touched on already in different parts of the program tonight. If sunlight kills COVID-19, would it help to put fluorescent lighting at entrances of public buildings like grocery stores? You talked a little bit about UV light specifically. Yeah, so I, these are all adjunctive um, technologies, as I like to say, they're, they're nice to have, but not a need to have. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best way to avoid aerosol spread of the virus? So again, this is um, maintaining our distance, doing that whole layering. I, I can't uh, emphasize enough how much the more you layer as many strategies as you can together, the more you'll be protected against COVID transmission, not just COVID transmission, but just in our daily um, exposure to any kinds of viruses. Okay. Um, a couple of related ones, I'm gonna merge them together. So with colder weather coming, uh, uh, and, and uh, wanting to sort of figure out how we're going to maintain some sort of social contacts. How can I stay safe while connecting with loved ones and friends? So tips on socializing at home or in restaurants or, or what kind of precautions I might take um, so that I don't feel so isolated and I can return to some of the activities I enjoy. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to trying to do some of these activities outside or in areas where you can remain distance, I think is important. Um, reflecting on times that maybe are not as busy in a restaurant setting. So, you know, perhaps that means um, kind of getting together during the day. I know, fortunately, for a lot of people um, who are at home, they may have more of a ability to kind of flex those times and go outside of busy times. Um, those are all different things that will help uh, as much as possible. Turn to video when you can. Um, and, uh, you know, as was mentioned, I think throughout these presentations, it's still a good way to connect with people. Um, but when you go out, you know, layering as well as thinking critically around what busy times are will all will help you kind of determine when you should go and meet up with your family members or, or close contacts. All right, last last few quick ones. How does smoking contribute to the spread of COVID-19? So, I mean, theoretically it shouldn't. The thing is, is that it depends on what kind of uh, social practices you have with smoking. So if you're in close contact um, with individuals who are outside of your social bubble, um, you know, going outside for a quick uh, cigarette um, in the context of a work environment, for example, um, you know, again, this is not ideal. Um, but if you are just going out independently um, and having a cigarette, that's a, a little bit of a different situation. I guess the, the, the question is also though to be had is how, how that is affecting your own general health. Um, and so I think this would be an opportune time to try and kick the habit if possible. And I think that you know um, anything that compromises your lungs at this point in time um, would be something that we would advise against because it makes you more susceptible to COVID transmission and not just COVID, any kinds of respiratory illnesses and, and the, the detrimental effects that may result out of that. Great. Um, do children experience the same symptoms of COVID as adults? Uh, yes, most certainly um, they go through the same. I think the, the predominant symptoms that I've been reading about really are the fever and the, and the cough. 
And so um, unlike any other respiratory pathogens that infect our children, I think um, these are still very important signs to look for. So this is the reason why children going to school, they were asking, they're asking for surveillance of um, you know, fevers, um, any new respiratory and to stay home, that's important. So same, same as adults, but fever and cough most predominant. What's the risk of hugging with a mask on both people? <laughs> I know we're all itching for that close contact and and uh, and we're looking for ways to um, you know minimize our chances of exposure and I you know again just layering keeping your hands clean knowing that the person's not sick um, making sure that you're wearing your mask duration of the hug all these things um, you want to consider minimize the time um, if you can avoid it again avoid it but these are the things I'm, I'm trying to be realistic I know that um, everyone is yearning to connect closely with close family members and friends and so the more things that you can kind of throw at it to make it a safe interaction the better you are um, at you know potentially being exposed okay. the last question I'll give you and then there's a couple more quick ones we'll finish up with um, how long does the virus live on various surfaces like groceries and is it necessary to clean your food after you purchase it? Yeah, so the virus can live outside the body for uh, up to 72 hours. Um, is it necessary to clean your, I don't. Um, I'll be realistic, I think the likelihood and how much contamination in the general public or in the in open areas is probably very small. Your biggest concern again is just being in close contact with people that are sick. Um, uh, and so, you know, if, if you want to give your stuff a quick wipe down um, when you bring it home, that's fine. I don't think it's necessary um, uh, really, but, um, you know, the things though that I do not naturally sometimes, which I know is may not be innate for others, is any kinds of fruits and vegetables. It's, it's common practice for me to clean um, these items as soon as I bring them home. It always has been. And so if that's something that wasn't your previous practice, these are things that might not necessarily be cooked or um, processed. I think that you should make sure you, you're heeding public health guidance, which that is normally public health guidance, to clean any of fruits or vegetables before you eat them. Great. All right, I'm gonna take the last three real quick ones and then I'm gonna wrap us up for the evening. Um, how dangerous is, is it to live in condos in terms of how the air circulates? So my selfish answer is, I sure hope it's good because I live in a condo. Um, I think what, what uh, Natasha talked about earlier tonight in terms of how the transmission occurs and what we know of it should give you some comfort about that. Um, there is no added risk of living in a condo. We know that it's not spread in the way that measles or chickenpox is, where it can actually be spread through air ducts into other units, et cetera. Um, that is the case with some things like measles, but it's not the case with this. So um, the, the, the answer is it's safe. Um, for snowbirds traveling to winter climates for the winter, what would your advice be for this year? So it's a complicated one. Um, I go back to Natasha's comment, if you can stay home, stay home but recognizing that some people, their, their life uh, pattern is to spend several months of the year in a warmer climate. Um, I guess I would break it down this way and I'd invite Natasha or others to jump in. Um, there's the risk of the travel itself. So you're gonna have to get onto a crowded airplane with people that may or may not be compliant with using their mask for the whole flight. Uh, so there's the risk of going and there's a risk of coming back. There's the, the likelihood that you may be isolated you may have to self-isolate when you go and or when you return, depending on the rules that are in place uh, when you go and when you come back. And when you go somewhere, you're now adopting the risk of that environment. So we know what our environment risk is here in, in Toronto. And I've got to say in, in Ontario, we've been pretty good. We're sliding a little bit the last few days and we're all watching that closely. But by and large, I think it's been taken seriously and a lot of very appropriate measures have been put in place. Um, some of those destinations for snowbirds like Florida have not had such a great record. So you're accepting the risk of the place that you're going. So you have to balance your risks and benefits. No one can answer the question for you on whether you should or you shouldn't, um, but you have to keep that in mind. And the last question is, and I think this is a really important one to end on, how safe is it to schedule surgery now and into the fall? I need cataract surgery, but I'm wondering if I should just wait until there's a vaccine. So I guess my, I would come back to the comment that's been made several times. In, a, in an odd, almost paradoxical way, hospitals are some of the safest places you can be. Everyone coming in, staff, patients, the few visitors that are allowed, 
They're all screened. There's PPE that's used in all the encounters. People are very, very vigilant. Um, I think there's a greater risk to people if they defer treatment they need than, than to come and seek it. And we saw that in the first wave. Our emergency department visits dropped. And now we're starting to see people that come in delayed uh, because they didn't come seek care earlier. And now they come with more advanced uh, more advanced symptoms or more advanced disease. So I would strongly encourage people if they need care, don't be afraid to come to the hospital to get that care. All right. I think that's been a, a, a action packed evening. Uh, we've come to the conclusion of our questions and answers. Please be sure to take a moment and fill out the electronic evaluation form. That will really help us as we plan future uh, talks and topics for you. And I would like to finally thank our speakers once again for an incredibly informative evening and a big thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. We really look forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.